your cell phones put on vibrate or on silence um, so that we can hear what Dr. Casaberry has to say to us for today. Today our guest speaker is Dr. Richard Casaberry. He really doesn't need any introduction because he's a pet pioneer himself. He is a, a professor of medicine at UCLA Medical Center and medical director of the Rehabilitation Clinical Trial Center. And if any of you have participated in research, this is the man in charge of research. We are so um, lucky to have Harbor UCLA so close and really lucky to have Dr. Casaberry uh, speaking to our group because he speaks all over the world. And uh, we're just pleased to have them. And the things that we learned, Betsy and I and Joseph, on how to train you guys and how to exercise you guys and the latest trends in pulmonary, we learned from this man. So we're really blessed to have him in our group. So today, Dr. Casaberry is going to speak on chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is COPD. And he has uh, some information up here at the end, and he will tell you a little bit more about um, a website that he is dear and near to him. And again, we can always learn something from the different uh, websites that are out there for people with COPD. So, uh, Dr. Casaberry, welcome. Thank you, Jackie. I, I actually got a name tag that I, I had to turn around to take a look at. It says Richard Casaberry, honorary pep pioneer since day one. <laughs> but it's not true. It's not true. I think I first came and worked with you guys in like 1988, which may sound like year one, but it's not because because uh, our friend Mary Burns and Jackie was, uh, when, when did you start, start with it? I probably, when did you start? I thought it was 88. Because I was 88. 88? I had my son so in 89. We, no, we no, sort no. of, um, no, you're right, 88. I remember when your son was born. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, we did, we did research together. That's right. That's right. We did well, we did we did spur together. And then together. Oh. Spur together. And then together. <laughs> together. <laughs> yeah, we did all kind of stuff. We did all kind of stuff. <laughs> we had a good time. <laughs> I'm going. The Jackie asked me to give a sort of a back to the basics lecture, which I'm I'm really happy to do. Uh, um, on COPD. Now the the question is, why would a bunch of people who probably most of you have COPD want to spend a, a nice day, it's really nice outside, uh, in a dark room hearing about uh, the things, the disease you have. Anybody got a good answer for that? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. <laughs> but the, I think the principle and the, the whole, one of the tenets of rehabilitation is it's better to know than to not know. And once you know, you can understand. Once you understand, you can do something about it. So uh, we, I'm going to spend a while talking about COPD and sort of bring you back to the beginning and then then, then spend, uh, spend a while going forward uh, about this illness that I spend all my time on. Uh, as Jackie said, uh, we're over at Harbor UCLA. Isn't that a nice building? Uh, we, we moved into that building about uh, two, three years ago uh, from our hut we had, uh, our, our, our dump, our trailer, exactly, our barracks, called them all kinds of funny names. Uh, but this is a really nice building. We have a a, a lot of nice labs. If you ever come over and visit us, uh, there's, there's parking over there to the right so you can park. And, and um, we have a very nice time there. And uh, it's a home of COPD research. That's what we do. That's about, about all we do. And we have 10 or 12 research studies going on at any given time trying to find ways of, of making life better. Uh, there's the uh, group of undesirables there. You can see... Uh, see uh, a lot of uh, Letty Diaz has been with us forever, and Dave Shaw, young investigator, Bill Stringer, uh, middle-aged investigator, Harry Rossiter, young investigator, a bunch of postdoctoral fellows who we have, um, uh, coordinators, coordinators, and there's this old man standing in the middle there. Uh, I don't know what he's doing there. Come, come, come over and visit us. Well, we'll talk. We'll talk towards the end about some studies that are going on there, but I think I'll, I think I'll get into the talk for now. Um, okay, so here's the here's the sort of list of things. I uh, want to talk about what is COPD, how big a problem is it, what causes COPD, how is it diagnosed, how is it treated, and what's on the horizon. I think it's a pretty full agenda. Uh, okay, there's, there, there we are. Uh, to me, people are just lungs. Everything else is sort of 
incidental. Um, you, have, you have an airway up above, and you have your nose and your mouth, and you sort of breathe through those. You go down to the, the, uh, to the trachea, which branches into two main stem bronchi, to the right and left lung, and the idea is to get air in and get air out and have that air exchange uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide with the blood, and that's how we live. That's how we live. Uh, the lungs are sort of marvelous if you think about it. Um, here's the way you, you go. You, you have a, these big airways. That's the trachea here. One airway branches into two, and then two branches into four, and four branches into eight, eight into 16, 16 into 32. And that happens 23 times. Think of how many there are until you get down to the point where you start having these little outpouchings that are called alveoli, which are actually places where gas uh, and air sort of get in contact with each other. And uh, that's the uh, operating unit of you know, so lung. But you can sort of see that these uh, eventually, I mean, this is sort of uh, maybe an inch across, maybe a little bit less. But how big are these across? Well, they're tiny, tiny little things. Very, very fine, really very marvelous piece of, uh, piece of engineering, if I, if I do say so. And uh, it all has to work in order to get gases exchanged and to have lungs work right. Uh, what does COPD do? It has two major effects that are bad. Some people have more of one and more of the other. The first is it takes the airways and makes them thickened and makes the, the muscles that surround them sort of spasm and uh, get sort of inflamed and nasty and you sort of get junk in the airway so it's hard to pass gases back and forth. And besides the airways, the, the lung sacs, these alveoli, get uh, in trouble as well. And sometimes they actually get destroyed and go away and we get big holes. So there's two kinds of things that are, that are COPD. They sort of, uh, it used to be, we used to talk about people having bronchitis and emphysema, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But we talk about COPD as a joined definition because most people who have it have both have components of both. Some have more of one and more of the other. And until recently, we'd sort of treat this, the airways and the, the uh, alveolar disease sort of similar. So it didn't make much sense to separate it. But we'll talk, we'll talk some about how it might, that may be changing, because we have treatments now that are different for the different kinds of COPD. So talk about the airway one. We call this, the name is chronic bronchitis. Chronic means you have it, have it a lot and all the time, and bronchitis, the airways are called bronchi, and itis means sort of inflamed and, and uh, swollen. And as, uh, as I showed you before, you have uh, airways that uh, get thickened and have mucus in them, and that's not so, so good. And, the, oops, and if you look at the airways and the cells along the, uh, the airways, you know, you have uh, in normal lungs, you have cells that sort of line it. You have these little f hairs. Uh, that sort of um, brush back and forth and help expel bad things and have a nice little mucus and layer here and you have this, this thing that generates the mucus and that's all very nice. In COPD what happens is you get more of these mucus glands and they, they're more down here and they produce a lot of stuff and the, these little hairs go away uh, and then you can't transport the stuff as well and get rid of the stuff you need to get and there's more of it. A lot of mucus production. There's sort of a classic way the person with chronic bronchitis looks. This is an old picture from the 1950s or 60s of what we used to call the blue bloater. A person who's got low oxygen levels may have swelling of their legs because uh, fluid builds up in their legs. They have a lot of cough and sputum production. You can sort of hear it in their chest. Emphysema is, again, as I said, different. This is sort of, uh, you see, well, that looks like a moth's been eating it. Well, that's what it looks like. It looks like a moth eating appearance. The holes in the lung are what is left when the alveoli go away. And if you look under a microscope, instead of having these nice little fine things here that are functional, you have big holes that really don't do very well. And it sort of ends up looking like that. If you do a, uh, this is a thin slice of a lung. This is a healthy lung. Looks like there's a lot of stuff going on here. And here you see, again, moth-eaten. A lot of parts that there's really nothing going on. The lung doesn't function. Pulmonary emphysema. And this is what the emphysemic is supposed to look like classically. Call them a pink puffer. Have a lot of shortness of breath. May lose weight, which is not a good thing, unless you want. I might, I'd love it if I could lose some weight. But sometimes these people are losing weight and they don't want to. And they, they, they breathe pretty hard and they get respiratory muscle fatigue. 
And COPD is something that ages people. Uh, this is, I, I, like, I like this, this sort of transition. No, I, think, I, think, I still think she's cute, actually. <laughs> but cute in a different, different way. This is what COPD does, the consequences of COPD. Some of these are, 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 are bigger words than they need to be. Dyspnea means shortness of breath. People who are short of breath, especially when we try to do things. Cough, sputum production. Other things that go on, they sort of go with COPD. Things like uh, not being able to sleep well, having muscle problems, uh, being depressed, things like that go with COPD. Heart problems actually are more common in COPD than non-COPD patients. Symptoms at night, being tired, having your health status, your quality of life de decreased. And if you get an infection, it takes you a while to recover from them. So these are all things that go along with uh, living with COPD. As I said, it's a systemic disease. This gives a list. Uh, I, I talked about the lungs being inflamed. It means they're, they're sort of swollen and, and nasty. Well, it turns out that throughout the body, there is systemic infl inflammation. Uh, sometimes when you have COPD, the muscles don't work as well as they should. Nutritional problems, again, losing weight is a problem uh, with some people. Gaining weight is, is a problem with some. Sleep disturbances, high prevalence of depression and anxiety. And the best cure for depression and anxiety in COPD is Exercise. pulmonary rehabilitation. Is, is Jackie Tussolini. Absolutely. Okay, how big of a problem is it? You know, I, I used to, uh, I started working on COPD in the 1980s, and nobody wanted to talk about it. Nobody would invite me to speak. And now everybody invites me to speak. Isn't that nice? And it's because, it's not a good reason, it's because COPD is a, a, a big problem and we need to do something about it. It is amazingly the third most common reason to die of all things. And heart disease is number one, cancer is number two, COPD is number three, and that's amazing. Strokes number four, where we actually went up a place. Major cause of disability. And amazingly, uh, it'll, it'll be amazing in a minute. You'll understand why it's amazing in a minute. COPD is the only major cause of death where the death rates continue to rise. We're actually doing a pretty good job with heart disease. People, less, fewer people die of heart disease now. A lot of people do. Huge number of people do, but it's less than it used to be. Same with cancer. Cancer is actually sort of leveling, leveled out. But COPD still is rising in, in death rate. And uh, that should come. Why, why is that surprising? Why is that surprising? Because fewer people smoke, right? Exactly. Fewer people smoke. So why doesn't it, why doesn't that translate? Well, it will translate in about 20 years. When you clear out my generation, okay? We, we were sort of the last generation where smoking was sort of okay. After that, a lot of people stop smoking and they will, very few of them will get COPD. But we need to, but right now, for, for now, it's just a tremendous problem. We're still having increasing death rates. Uh, how many people have it? Well, the, the number is something like 24 million people, composed of two groups: 12 million people who know they have COPD, and 12 million people who don't have, don't know they have it. So it's an underdiagnosed disease. And sometimes we are. This 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 this, this makes it clear. We, you know, when does it come to a? When do you get to the doctor to find out you've got the disease? Well, it turns out a lot of people come when they're pretty far along. Uh, this thing says that. Only, um, let me see, only 19% get to a doctor's attention when they have mild disease, about half of them with moderate disease, a quarter of them with severe disease already, and 5% with very severe disease. But that's really sort of surprising. It means we're not doing a good enough job to diagnose the disease. This is a complicated slide, the slide that has one, one well, here, here's, a, here's an interesting message. Between uh, people between 75 and 84 years old in the United States, about 10% of them have COPD. That's a huge number. It's a huge number. And even, you know, it's my age group, 65 to 74, about 10%, a little less than 10%. But the other message here is that women versus men, almost the same. It used to be that COPD was a, was a, uh, was a men's disease. Marlboro man, not true anymore. Equal opportunity abuser. No question about it. And I can see by the population here, it sort of bears it out. A lot of men, a lot of women. Uh, it costs a lot of money. This, this slide says it costs about $50 billion a year. Even in Obama money terms, 
It's a lot of money. That's a lot of, that's a lot of money to take care of, of COPD patients. Um, and a lot of office visits, 16.3 million office visits, a lot of emergency room visits, a lot of hospitalizations. A person who has COPD is more, about three times as likely to be hospitalized as a person who doesn't have COPD, you know, for, for a given kind of person. So it's a very high health care utilization uh, illness. What causes COPD? What's, okay, what's the top five risk factors for COPD? Top five, let me think. One, think about one, two, three, okay. So number one is smoking. Number two is, number two, anybody? Anybody? Smoking. 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 It's all smoking. If we didn't smoke, it would be a very uncommon illness. Now, there are other, are other causes, but they're not, they're, they're like 80 to 90 percent of COPD is caused by smoking. Why is that? It's because smoking harms both the alveoli and it harms the airways. Uh, contains hazardous substances that may damage the lungs. That damage the lungs when they inhale. Didn't say may. They, they do damage the lungs when they're inhaled. Nasty stuff. Nasty stuff. Um, the risk factors of COPD. This sort of highlights the other ones. Cigarette smoke is the main one. There are some occupational deaths and chemicals that. Um, are, are harmful, and some indus industries will uh, do that, but mostly we've sort of weeded those out by now. Uh, that, that doesn't affect anymore. Environmental tobacco smoke, secondhand smoke, is actually a minor cause of COPD, but we sort of want to dissuade people from smoking, so we don't want them smoking around us, so we don't, we, we, we stress that. Indoor and outdoor po air pollution. Uh, in other countries, people who are, women who cook over open cook stoves in, indoors, can get COPD over many, many years. It's not common anymore. It doesn't happen in the United States, but that's another good way of getting COPD. Genetic causes, and I'll talk about this later when I talk about our genetic studies, it's very clear that some people smoke and don't get COPD. And we don't know why, and we're going to find out. And it has something to do with your genes. And we've got a big project underway to try to find which genes are responsible. Of course, if you get more infected, that damages the lungs. It turns out that poor people tend to get COPD more than, uh, than wealthy people. Not clear why that is. And uh, age, young people don't have COPD. It takes a long time of abusing your body with cigarette smoke to, to get it. Uh, what co what's the uh, pathophysiology? It means how does it work? Tobacco smoke mainly causes inflammation in the lungs, which damage, damage both the airways and the lung structure. And they both lead to limitation on airflow, which is sort of the hallmark of COPD. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, well, so this sort of a, a digression. What, how do you know if you got COPD or you have asthma? They are both diseases where it's hard to breathe out. And that, it has that in common. But they really are very different diseases. And it, it wasn't long ago when doctors would not give people a diagnosis of COPD because they thought that was impolite or something like that. They would say, you have a touch of asthma. But that's not really true, and we really need to differentiate, because we now treat them, treat the two diseases quite differently. So both are characterized by limitation to airflow, but causes and treatments are different. In particular, a COPD is due to a noxious agent, tobacco smoke. And asthma is because you're allergic to something. You have a sensitizing agent. The kind of cells that get drawn into the lungs to, to deal with it are different in COPD and asthma. They both cause airflow limitation, but in asthma, the, the airflow limitation tends to be reversible with bronchodilators specifically. And a, a person between getting ill with asthma can have pretty no, normal lung function. Whereas in somebody with COPD, it says completely irreversible. That's not quite true. It's incomplete reversible. We can't get complete reversibility even with our good therapies that we apply these days. And I think I'm going to skip this. These, these are other things. If you're, if you're a nine-year-old kid and you say, Mommy, Mommy, I can't breathe, you probably don't have COPD. You probably have asthma, right? And if you're 65 years old and didn't have asthma as a kid and you can't breathe, it's probably COPD and not the other. But there's other ways of, of differentiating. And doctors should do this because, again, you treat the two illnesses uh, differently. Oops. <laughs> I don't know what just happened. <laughs> Closed. Oh my goodness! Well, maybe it's trying to tell me that I'm talking too too long.
die. That's interesting. Sponsored by Mercedes. <laughs> I wish it. I wish it was. Let's raffle off. Let's raffle off the car. There we go. I gotta drive home or something. Gee, I can't get Well, let's let's try let's try again. Okay. How is it diagnosed? Um, well. First of all, why is it hard to breathe out? There's, there's a couple good reasons for this. This is sort of a make-believe uh, lung unit, and this is the, the airway that goes from it. And in, in a healthy person, first of all, once you in, inhale, you sort of have sort of loaded a spring, and the air tends to be, this, this balloon tends to recoil and push air out, and that's good. And the airways are nice and wide, and they don't, they're not swollen. And you have muscles around here, the airway smooth muscles that are not, they're not uh, contracted. And besides, you have these little springs. That's the other alveoli. It sort of tend to hold, hold the open, airways open so they don't collapse when you bear down and try to breathe out. And COPD, a lot of things can go wrong. First of all, you don't have that springiness anymore. And your airways are thickened. And your airways tend to be bronchoconstricted by these... Uh, constricted by this, this muscle, and your springs are gone because you don't have as many alveoli surrounding that airway, and so therefore you don't get the push to get airflow out. That's the difficulty. How do you determine whether you have COPD? It's mainly this device here called a spirometer. You've, everybody's seen them, although not many, many people have not. Many people carry the diagnosis of COPD have never seen a spirometer. That's a, a shame. This is a very simple test. As you know, you take a deep breath in and you blow out. You measure how much air you come out comes out in a given period of time. Here's 10 seconds or 9 seconds. And uh, what you want is to see the air come out really fast. And after a second or two, all of it's out. But if you have COPD, the air comes out slowly. And you, you go like that. And we measure what we call the FEV1, forced expiratory volume in one second how much air comes out in that very first second, and if that's low, that indicates you probably have airflow obstruction. Very simple, not, not rocket science, very simple measurement, and allows us to deter, determine whether you have the, the illness and how severe it is. So the, 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 the issue is that we should have everybody who has symptoms like cough and speed production and shortness of breath and is exposure to things like tobacco Everybody should have a spirometer, a spirometry. And once you have your diagnosis, you should probably have it periodically as well to sort of see how you're doing. Simple test. Okay. How do you treat it? Now, again, when we started off here, the treatments were very few. Well, rehabilitation was always there. But we had to have very much in the way of other, other treatments that we thought we were really clear that worked. Um, of course, the first step is to stop smoking. Single most effective intervention to reduce the risk of developing COPD and to slow its progression. Show you data on that a little bit. Huge progress has been made in decreasing smoking prevalence. It's now, I believe, 11% of adults in the state of California, which is fantastic. Fantastic. It could always be lower. But I go to many places around the world and in the rest of the United States where their numbers are in the 20s and someplace in the 30s still. And I can remember when it was in the 40s. So we've done a, a wonderful job of dissuading people from smoking. Tough thing to do, but people do it. This sort of expresses why you want to stop smoking. This is a uh, classic figure that shows that here's lung function, measured by what? By FEV1, you all know what that is. It's how much airflow you can get out. And we start off at age 25, at the, your, that's about the, about the best shape you'll ever be in. And afterwards, afterwards in all of us, lung function declines. Fortunately for people who don't smoke, and, uh, that decline is such that it never, you never get into trouble. If you got to be 130, maybe you'd be puffing a little bit. Not going to happen. But in people who smoke and are sensitive to cigarette smoke, the lung function goes down. And at middle age, they reach a point where they're disabled from it. It's, it's, it's a problem. And if they go further than that, uh, that point is reached. But if you stop smoking, there's somebody who stops smoking at age 45. It's not that lung function gets better, but it gets worse at a much slower rate. So you see here a person who stops smoking at age 45, 
And here they are, it's now 80, they're 82 before they get disabled on average. Well, that's a good deal. You've got 25 years of benefit from having stopped smoking. Now, it's never too late to stop. Here's where somebody has sort of reached a point of disability, and then they decide to stop smoking. And they live longer, but that's not the best way to do it because they're not feeling very well. So this is this, the classic figure telling us why smoking, uh, smoking cessation is a good idea. And in fact, there's a, a classical study from the, uh, 2002 here that showed that. They took a whole bunch of people, who, a whole bunch of smokers. They measured their lung function. They gave them all, they gave, them, they gave most of them a smoking cessation program. I think they gave everybody a smoking cessation program. And they found that some people were able to quit and some people were not able to quit. And they followed the lung function of those who were able to quit, those who were unable to quit, and they saw their lung function over an 11-year period was better than the people who were able to quit. Now, you say, why? That, that's not a good way to do this. Like, why don't you have people who um, were made to quit and people who were made not to quit? That would be a better study design. We can't do that. We can't do that. Can't, nobody would likely do that. So this is, this is, this is as good as we're going to get. And, and, and appreciable differences. How do you stop smoking? Uh, the science has gotten a lot better. Counseling sessions, nicotine replacement, patches or gum, drugs that act to decrease nicotine dependence. There's two FDA-approved drugs that do that. Um, these therapies are additive. Uh, repeated attempts are often necessary. And repeated attempts are often successful. So this is the strategy for smoking cessation. Uh, one last, last note, e-cigarettes. E-cigarettes, you know what an e-cigarette is? Bad. Good, good, bad, bad, bad. Not, they've not been shown to be effective in, in, in curtailing smoking. And they may, in fact, be dangerous. And there's a, this is a very bad thing. You know, all you have to know about e-cigarettes is that, that the, the manufacturer of most e-cigarettes these days are, are tobacco companies. What, what, what are we thinking? Okay, so in terms of COPD therapies, is the glass half full or half empty? Uh, and I'll, I'll make the case that the glass is half full. In other words, we have some good things. And that we have current therapies that do decrease shortness of breath, we make people able to, to do more, improve their exercise tolerance, decrease COPD flare-ups. There's a number of them that do that. COPD flare-ups, getting sick from COPD are fewer if you take these therapies. And quality of life, how you feel about life is uh, better. We can do all those things. The things we can't do very well is modify the disease time course. Remember what I showed you with smoking? If you stop smoking, the, you, your lung function declines slower. That's the only thing we have that, that impacts lung function decline. The only thing that's been shown to work. And we don't have very many things that decrease mortality. The only thing that works for that is smoking cessation, oxygen therapy for people who need it, and something else I'm forgetting. Volume reduction surgery, I think, which is, is a sort of esoteric therapy. But it's not, not a very big list. We need to do better with, on these issues. We have a, a number of therapies, bronchodilators, steroids, pulmonary rehab, hooray, oxygen therapy, surgery, certain kinds of surgery, and issues on decreasing COPD flare-ups, I'll take you through some of these very quickly. You know what a bronchodilator is. It, it relaxes the muscles surrounding the airway walls, decreases resistance to airflow, especially on breathing out. We have both short-acting drugs that last a couple of hours and long-acting drugs that last up to a day uh, available. And we're having more and more and more available as, we, as time goes on. Long-acting bronchodilators have revolutionized COPD therapy. As I said, they reduce shortness of breath, increase exercise tolerance, improve quality of life, and surprisingly, actually, decrease COPD flare-ups and COPD hospitalizations. Well demonstrated, many studies, very clear that these are, these are good, good drugs. And fortunately, the side effects of them are pretty darn modest. So these, these are good deals, long-acting bronchodilators. Inhaled steroids, we, we, we use them as well in some people. Uh, they're used with bronchodilators and those with severe COPD, especially those who are having COPD flare-ups. They act to reduce swelling of the airways. And again, the main benefit is they tend to reduce COPD flare-ups. So if you're having COPD flare-ups, chances are your doctor will, will prescribe an inhaled steroid. Pulmonary rehabilitation, well, what can I say? Um, I'm giving this to another audience where, where, where they don't know what it is. 
outpatient sessions, three or four hours duration, two or three times a week, for eight to 12 weeks with absolutely lovely people. Uh, it, pulmonary rehabilitation improves exercise tolerance, decreases dyspnea, shortness of breath, improves quality of life measures, and it does this better than any other COPD therapy we have. Better than bronchodilators, better than steroids, better than all these things. Rehabilitation works better, well accepted that that's true. Also reduces health care costs, reduces exacerbations, does all kinds of other good things. Uh, what's, what makes rehabilitation effective? Um, my area, exercise training, I think is the, the key component, but everything else um, works in multidisciplinary, multi-specialty area, and uh, it's a real good therapy, and it's getting better all the time. Uh, here's me showing off a uh, paper uh, I, I published a few years ago in New England Journal of Medicine. If it's a New England Journal, it must be right. That's the <laughs> foremost medical journal. Pointing out that uh, rehabilitation, exercise training in particular, does a bunch of things to make people able to do more. Makes you less short of breath, centrally. Makes you less anxious and depressed. Reduces dynamic hyperinflation, that's sort of getting puffed up when you uh, start, try to exercise, and improves the function of these skeletal muscles. So I think that's uh, pretty clear. Oxygen therapy, oxygen is a good drug. Um, it's, uh, the problem is in, CO, in severe COPD, the ability to, of the lungs to transport oxygen from the air to the blood is impaired, and that's not a good thing. Organisms don't do well if they don't get enough oxygen. The, 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 um, the therapy is to give more oxygen, that works very well. Supplemental oxygen delivered through the nose effectively raises oxygen levels in the blood. Oxygen is often needed 24 hours a day, and stationary and portable devices are provided. Portable devices should be lightweight and nice to use, and there's good technological developments that are helping to, to, make, that, to make that available to everybody. Oxygen therapy reduces shortness of breath, increases exercise tolerance, and again, improves survival in people with low oxygen levels. This was shown by uh, our hero, uh, our late great hero, Dr. Tom Petty, who in 1980 published a study that everybody reads and everybody knows about showing that people who are, were randomized to receive oxygen versus those who were not receiving oxygen, people on oxygen lived a lot longer if they had low oxygen levels in their blood. And as a result, we can never do a study on that, on that, like that again because we can never randomize people not to get oxygen. That's an interesting sort of thing. Uh, here, here's here's Tom's, Tom Petty's study. There's a combination of two studies actually showing the people who were randomized to get oxygen all the time versus those who were randomized to get oxygen no, none of the time. The difference in survival was between about 75% and something like 30%. So no question about it. Oxygen therapy is good for people, and you, uh, you need it to live. Surgery isn't a main thing in COPD, but it, there, there are certain times when, you, when surgery is needed. For advanced disease, uh, lung transplantation is sometimes used in people who are, it's a tough procedure, so you have to be pretty well otherwise healthy in order to, to, to tolerate it. Uh, and it's done in diseases other than COPD. But in, in the minority of people, and I'm, we've had people in pet pioneers, right, who have gotten lung trans, transplants, it is, a, it is a good deal. There's another procedure called volume reduction surgery, which is, is one that we had a lot of interest in. Uh, it's faded a little bit. This is a 2003 paper, again, in New England Journal of Medicine where they essentially took people who, who had, had emphysema, okay, air, destruction of the lung, mainly up in the upper parts of the lung. That was the main, where they did it mostly. And they said, and the, so the, it's just destroyed, and then the lung sort of expands as the, the air spaces go away, and it sort of compresses the lung down below, which makes it, it makes the better part of the lung not function as well. So what you do is you actually cut out the upper parts of the lung like that, and sew it back up, and let the better part of the lung sort of expand. And it sort of sounds strange because you're taking away lung from people who don't have enough lung, but in the end, it turned out to, to work reasonably well. Uh, again, only for a very small fraction of people who have se severe um, emphysematous, emphysema, COPD. Um, and it's, it's done infrequently mainly because people don't want to get surgery, and I don't, I don't blame them. Only a couple hundred cases are done in the United States, even though Medicare covers it. What's happened, though, is that um, 
other ways of providing that same benefit non-surgically have been are being tried. And this is one of them, and I'll, I'll tell you about it. We're actually doing this at, at Harbor. And if anybody is interested in the study, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about it. I'll, I'll tell you about it later. The idea is what you want to do is you take the, the parts of the lung that aren't functioning well, and what you'd like to do is for them to go away. Well, what go away could be collapsed. Those parts that are sort of full of, of air, non-functional, you want them to sort of collapse. What you do is you take a, a bronchoscope, take a thing that you put, put down into the lung, and you put it out to that part of the lung that, with an airway that feeds that part of the lung that you want to collapse. And you stuff a little valve in it, tiny little valve. This is the size of a, you know, like that, that big. Tiny little valve, and you put it in there, and it sort of it ends up in the airways, and it lets air out, but doesn't let air in. So you breathe out, and that lung collapses a little bit. You take a breath in, and it doesn't fill. Breath out, breath in. So eventually, that part of the lung collapses. It's a little bit more difficult than it sound than I made it sound, but in the end, these are uh, th this is one of the um, advancing therapies for that kind of emphysema. Uh, severe emphysema uh, that are being tried, and I'll tell you about the clinical trial that we're doing in a little while. It's not this is not approved by the Food and Drug Administration yet because it's still experimental. You just try try to see if, if long-term outcomes are, are better. Uh, and then the, the the other thing about decreasing COPD therapies, I told you that flare-ups are a big deal in COPD, and we made a lot of progress. Probably the biggest progress we've made in the last 15 years in finding ways of decreasing the number of times people get sick. Uh, those of us who think about COPD a lot about 15 years ago got, got, got together and said, well, what are we going to do next? What we, where can we have our biggest impact? And I said, well, we find a cure. Yeah, well, we said, well, yeah, how are you going to do it? I said, uh, I don't know. Uh, we, we're not smart enough to, to figure out cures yet. But this one was a goal we thought we could do. People get sick, and that's bad. And all you'd have to do is decrease the number of, you know, the, the frequency, the number of times you have somebody gets sick three times a year and you get them sick twice a year, well, that's a good deal. Or maybe once a year. Yeah, that, that's a good deal. And in fairly fast order, we found a number of things that work. And you should, you should know this. Uh, flu shots, pneumovac shots, absolutely no-brainers. No side effects. Decrease exacerbations very nicely. I talked about inhaled steroids. They decrease exacerbations. Long-acting bronchodilators, both the the beta agonist and the anticholinergic are two different kinds. They both decrease exacerbations, and they're probably additive. Oxygen therapy does it. Pulmonary rehabilitation does it. And a collaborative self-management, that's working with your doctor to make sure that if you get sick, you get seen fast so that you can get therapy fast so you don't have to, you're not waiting around. All those things reduce exacerbations. Uh, here's another thing that reduces exacerbations. There's a study, again, I've seen a lot of New England Journal of Medicine. And uh, what you see, you see, see that there? There's me. There, there I am. Um, this is a study that, that your tax dollars paid for. We took 1,142 patients and who people would have been having uh, exacerbations, this lung flare-ups, and gave them an antibiotic, azithromycin, Zithromax, z -Pax. We gave them an antibiotic pill every day for a year and found that, in fact, when we looked at it, uh, 27% reduction in exacerbations, in flare-ups. That's a good deal. And this is on top of everything. They've been taking everything the doctor had prescribed. We added this thing, 27% fewer. So this is a big success. This is the kind of study we need to, to show what works and what doesn't. What's on the horizon? Let me see. What did I talk about? A whole bunch of things. Uh, there's going to be a whole bunch of new bronchodilators coming out. You've already seen them on TV. I'm going to Las Vegas next week to... to at a meeting where they're going to initiate another a new bronchodilator combination. You can see this coming at you. Uh, how do you like the name Steolto? Steolto. It sounds terrible. What, they, what were they thinking? Steolto. It sounds like stiletto. It sounds like stiletto or some greasy Italian guy, you know? Um, I don't know how they picked the name, but this is, the, this is going to be the combination of your friend Spiriva, good drug, with a beta agonist called Oladaterol in one inhaler in the Respimat inhaler. A, a, a nice drug, terrible name. But there's a whole, whole bunch of new bronchodilators that we're going to be using and probably going to start using commonly combinations of the two different kinds of bronchodilators in the same inhaler. New anti-inflammatories, inhaled steroids are good but they're not great. 
new ways of exacerbation, new kinds of oxygen therapy, new clinical trials that show us what works, perfecting pulmonary rehabilitation if it's not perfect, perfect already. Uh, niche therapies for the minorities of patients, people who, for instance, who are losing weight, what are we going to do with them? And then finally, the, these genetic-based treatments and potential cures. The genetically-based treatments, uh, is, uh, I, this is my absolute favorite study of all time. This is a study where we recruited 10,500 people, um, 760 at Harvard UCLA, believe it or not, 760. There's a bunch of you in the room who participate in this study. Uh, trying to figure out what is the genetic, just what genetic factors predispose to COPD. This is again is your your tax dollars at work, National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Started in 2007, recruited like crazy, got 10,500 people at 22 sites, and performed what's called a whole genome analysis. Looked at a million different characteristics of your genetic makeup and compared them between people who had smoked and had COPD and smoked and didn't have COPD to find out what's different. And this study has already published 140 papers. 140 papers have come out of this study and we're just, we're just hitting our stride. There'll, there'll probably be twice as many of that eventually. And we're now, uh, and some of you have been kind enough to participate in this, everybody who participated five years ago is coming back for a five-year visit so we can see how you're doing and determine what causes people to get worse or not get worse. So we're, we're doing those studies. Absolutely wonderful study. Potential cures, I list these two because we did them. Uh, stem cell infusions, that sounds sexy. Uh, alveolar growth factors, regrowing lungs. How could, that be, how could that not be good? Well, they didn't work. We tried them. We tried. The good news is that we didn't hurt anybody. <laughs> you always got to worry about that. The bad news is that we didn't help anybody, and we'll, we, we need to keep trying. On that, in fact, we have a, a new study that I'll, that I'll tell you about in a minute. So that's my sort of tour through. Now I'm going to tell you a couple, a couple of studies that that will uh, that we're doing at, at Harvard UCLA that you might conceivably want to participate in, and uh, then I'll t then I'll take uh, questions. Um, the first, uh, not, most of you are not qualified for. Sorry. Do you know anybody who has never smoked? How many people never smoked? <sighs> never smoked and don't have much in the way of lung disease. I, I, some, some people are we, The COPD gene study studies people who have smoked, and we have 10,500 people, but we need a bunch of people to do the same sort of procedures who have never smoked so we can have a good comparison group. And the study involves about a three hour, three hours over in our place, and you sort of laugh and joke, and do an, you do an exercise test, and you do a uh, spirometry, and you do a... Uh, I answer a bunch of questionnaires, and you do a CT scan, CT scan of the chest, and then you go, then you go away, and we pay you uh, 80 bucks for your time, and uh, you, you'll get our thanks. So we need people who have never smoked and are of the 45 and up age group. And I've got some, some, some flyers for that if you're at all interested, or you know somebody, you know somebody might be interested in coming by. Uh, the sad thing is that I, I'm embarrassed to say you have to be either a, uh, a non-Hispanic Caucasian or an African American, uh, for bad reasons. There's no Asians or Hispanics in this study. Uh, the, the bad reason is we we couldn't answer the questions we we wanted to answer with only 10,500 people if we included everybody. Uh, it's a, a bad a bad. But but th this is a this is a nice study. It doesn't take me much time. Pays you 80 bucks. Uh, another study is this the valve study that I told, told you about. What we're doing is we're evaluating people who have again. Pretty severe emphysema, mostly in the upper parts of the lungs. Your doctors will know if that's true. Um, to look and see whether you, whether these valves will help. This is a pretty involved study, and if you don't have a lot of time or uh, you know have trouble getting around, it probably isn't for you. It pays about twenty five hundred bucks. Worth you, you work for it, believe believe me. But it's it's a it's a it's a good study, and again. The therapeutic possibility of this actually helping is pretty high. There's some good studies that show that this actually does help a very select group of people who, um, who need it. And then finally, there's this study called PI. This is my friend, Dr. Renard from Nebraska, put this together. It's prostaglandin inhibition for emphysema, uh, PI. On the first day we, we, when we got the grant, I received in the mail a FedEx package with a PI in it. 
big cherry pie. <laughs> Prostaglandin inhibition for emphasis of pie. And it, this is a very, uh, this is actually the, the ver one of the first well-focused studies on a COPD cure, in a sense, because we think that one of the problems with lungs with people with COPD is they can't repair themselves like everybody else's can. You know, it, it, it can, cigarette smoke causes destruction, but some people apparently are able to resist that or to repair the lungs, and some people are not. And we're trying to figure out why, why that is. Dr. Renard's theory is that um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, things like Motrin, are a good thing and will help the lungs to repair themselves. So we're, t we're, we're recruiting a bunch of people who have emphysema and uh, we'll randomize them to receive either a year's worth of Motrin taken once a day or not. And the major outcomes are CT scans and also bronchoscopy to look down and grab some samples of lung to see what's in it. So if you don't like bronchoscopies, don't do it. This study pays about, about $1,800 for the study. And may or may not, again, this, this is an early stage study. We can't, I can't guarantee that it's going to help. And of course, half people are, are randomized to get the non drug So it's a, an, another, another thing that you might want to um, participate in. Oh, and then finally, we, you guys have a very nice website, but there's another very nice website in the South Bay, and this is the Pulmonary Education Research Foundation. Uh, Kurt and uh, Dan are uh, sort of double, do double duty here and there, and we're, we're, we're really pleased to have them. We went through and made a, a major upgrade uh, and an update of our website, and I think it looks very, very nice now. And we also are doing something that is, um, I think, is sort of novel. We're sending out what we call a blog. Every week we send out a, a message, an email, and the email says, uh, you know, this week we're going to talk about this. And you click on it and you go to the website and it has a paragraph or two talking about this. I think this week it's talking about uh, living at altitude with COPD. And um, if you want to, I wish you would. Whoops, wrong. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> there's, a, there's absolutely no uh, obligation to this. I'm going to pass, up, pass around a, uh, a sign-up sheet. If you have an email address, put your name, first and last name and your email address you will put, the, put, this on, put you on the list, and you'll get an email once a week. Just educational stuff, not, nothing, nothing, nothing else. We're not going to come out and grab you and make you do research studies. Although, if you want to, you can. So I, I have, a, again, for, for pass outs, this is if you know people who are non-smokers and might want to participate. And this is the one for the emphysema study, uh, the, the valve study. You can take this, take it, take it with you, see if, you, if it, it makes any sense. And these, Jackie, can you help me and sure. get, get these, these things out? We'll pass one per table. Just put your name down. I, pr I promise. We, 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 we have, we're, we're doing this thing, and we want people to, to uh, read it. It's no fun if nobody reads it. And I'd be glad to take any questions you might have if I haven't gone too, too long. Did I go too long? Read it, read it, Jackie, read it. Okay. Um, somebody asked me to ask you <clears throat> um, about pneumonia curing emphysema. Curing emphysema? Uh, uh, that doesn't sound familiar at all. Pneumonia is a bad thing. And, uh, in fact, people who get, who have lung flare-ups and pneumonias will probably have more trouble, not less. So who, who, who said, who, what, what, I, I, I might be missing something. Yeah, pl please, tell, tell me what you've you're, you're got in mind. I'm sorry, you, you'll have to... Be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. Be quiet. Be quiet. You know, I, I, that, that doesn't sound like anything I know about. Uh, it sounds uh, unlikely. But, you know, the, the appearance of lung scans can change from time to time. But there's nothing about pneumonia that cures 
does anything good. Having, having pneumonia, bad. Bad. Don't get pneumonia. Please. Yep. Uh, that's e-cigarettes. I talked about those briefly. E-cigarettes are, it's a solution with nicotine in it, and you, you have a device that vaporizes it and with, with, it, with some ethylene glycol, and you inhale in your lungs, and you blow it out. It looks like smoke. It's not smoke. It's ethylene glycol. Um, but it's nicotine, and we don't know how much nicotine's in it, and these things have never undergone testing. Every time you have a drug, it goes through a billion dollars of testing before you can sell it. These things have not undergone any testing. They, they came out of China. <coughs> not that everything bad out of China is that everything is bad out of China. They came out of China, and they're going on the market, and they make unreasonable claims for them that they help people stop smoking. But what we know is that kids are starting to smoke them. And once you get addicted to nicotine, that's a bad thing. It's, a, it's an addictive drug with no benefits. It's only bad stuff. So e-cigarettes are bad. Is that, you, that okay with you? Carly? Commercial TV with Commercial on TV with, with kids in it. Well, they're, they're not, they're, they really have kids in them? Oh, yes, yes. That's, a, that's an anti-e-cigarette commercial. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And that's our, that's our, next, our, our next major mission. I mean, we, we beat back cigarettes, and the tobacco companies are trying to do an end run and addict people to nicotine so they'll smoke more cigarettes. It's just a, a very, very bad thing, and you should recognize it. Kurt? Doctor, are there any new developments around the corner uh, for oxygen generators that are making them smaller, more portable, uh, lighter? Uh? Well, I, you know, the, the, the good news is, you know, if you, ten, 10 years ago we had none. Uh, and I think that they will progressively get smaller. The point is that uh, it's a fairly high power requirement to, to separate oxygen from nitrogen, which is what these concentrators do. And we know that uh, some of these very small ones aren't good for a lot of people. People who need a lot of oxygen can't do on these really small ones. I think it's a technological problem. It will continue to get better. It, it turns out that the process by which the oxygen and nitrogen are separated are the same in the portable concentrators as they are in the bigger ones you have in your living room. The process is identical. I think that somebody needs to come up with a different molecular mechanism and then we can make another uh, leap forward. I had a slide that I made up uh, years ago. It was a, an iPod. You know, the, the guy dancing around with his iPod with his, with his ears. I, I redrew it so it was, it was an oxygen concentrator with, with his nose. He was dancing around. Yeah. I thought that, that was cool. And then an iPod-sized oxygen concentrator. And I, I, would, I would actually guess within 20 years we'll probably have something that really looks like that. It's very small and uh, can be used very conveniently. But I, I, would, I would take a step back and say things are getting better. The other, the other part of auction is that the uh, uh, Medicare rules are getting much, much more uh, difficult. Yeah. And uh, liquid oxygen, as I saw a liquid oxygen thing is being, Jackie says, cut out. Very, very uh, problematic. It's because they're paying less for it and the companies are responding, we're not going to provide expensive stuff. And the most expensive thing about oxygen therapy is the truck that brings it out to your house. That's the real expensive thing. Yeah. That's the, the auction itself doesn't cost anything. It's the truck that brings it to your house. So if you can develop a model that doesn't require people to come to your house, that's cheaper. Well, it, it, it doesn't work. It, it, it can work. It can work, but it cannot work as well. It has to be done carefully. Well, you know, that, that some places they make you do that. They make you go down to the store, go down to their, their auction store and get and pick up your tanks. And I guess for some people that's okay, but some people it's not. Some people it's not. Please. Yeah. Uh, has anybody done research on marrow's, marijuana's effects on the lungs? The answer is absolutely yes. There's a, a very... Uh, famous researcher up at UCLA, a guy named Don Tashkin, who in the 1980s and 1990s did a lot of work on marijuana's effects on the lung. And the answer is marijuana effects on the lung are almost as bad as cigarettes. However, however, nobody smokes two packs a day of marijuana. 
right? Yeah. The, 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 the dose of marijuana, the frequency of marijuana smoker is low, is smoke is low enough so that most people, almost all people, are not going to get the sort of, sort of lung disease effects that, that we, did, we get from cigarettes. But the potential is there. If you had a real pothead and smoked for 20 years, and I smoked a lot of marijuana, flattened their back from being doped out, I guess they would get lung disease. And there's some other, there's some other uh, drugs, like cocaine and smoking and things like that, crack cocaine, that are, are, are bad for the lungs, but not the, the way that, we, that cigarettes are. When you get your first uh, COPD patient, you never smoke cigarettes, but smoke marijuana, then you'll we, in, indeed, indeed. Well, but they're around. Yeah. Not very common, though. But thank you. Dan. Uh, Dr. Casper, what, uh, what's been learned about the testosterone studies? What, what we've learned from those? Dan, Dan's remembering a, a study we did and published in 2004, a long time ago. Um, the, the idea is that exercise is good for muscles, but can we give something, so a pill? Can we get a pill that makes the muscles change like they do in the, when, when you exercise? And the answer is that sort of testosterone is a drug that we know is, you know, people abuse it. But for people who are uh, who are weak and have trouble, you know, getting out of the house, it might be a reasonable thing to use. So we did a study, and in fact found that the muscles got bigger when you did testosterone, and they got stronger, and that was good. But testosterone has side effects, and they're, they're, it's a little problematic. If you're a woman, you grow you grow a beard. That's never that's never good. And guys, they have to worry about your prostate. It turns out that there are new drugs, there are new, uh, new generation of drugs coming out. We actually are doing, we just finished up a trial at Harbor on one of them, and the other one will probably start next year. Uh, these are new kinds of molecules that don't have the side effects that testosterone does, and we think that they're, they're, they're also going to be able to make muscles bigger and stronger. Uh, and perhaps, you know, right now you can go to, some doctors will prescribe testosterone for certain kinds of weak COPD patients, but it's not common because of the side effect issues. Uh, but someday we'll have drugs that will be better at that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Does Robert have an exercise study going on? Do we have an exercise study going on right now? It turns out the one we have just sort of closed. Okay. Uh, we, we do a lot of, a lot of our work is on rehabilitative type therapies and how other drugs interact with exercise rehabilitation. We're just finishing up um, a group of people. We'll have more. Come on, come on down. And the nice thing is, these studies won't accept you if you're in, you're actively in a rehabilitation program. But if you're out six months or so, it's fine to come along. And we have we have a very nice exercise facility, as, as you know, Carlin. Um, and we uh, we love to do exercise. That's our favorite thing to do. Well, testosterone is a, the, testosterone is an anabolic steroid, and the stuff you take by inhalation is called a corticosteroid. They say the steroid in their names, but they don't do the same things at all. They're different kinds of drugs, and sometimes we the athletes will say a steroid, they'll mean testosterone, and you guys say just say steroid, you mean a corticosteroid that you inhale. They do very different things. Really, have nothing to do with each other. An anabolic steroid uh, is it, like testosterone, affects the muscles, makes them bigger. An inhaled steroid affects the airways and makes them swell less. Different sort of thing, totally. But thank, thank you for clarifying that. That's, a, that's an important thing to, to work out. Please. I would like to be one of your studies. I'd like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, you want to be old enough to participate? No, I might have, maybe you're not. <laughs> but I'm a little older than what you said the cutoff date was. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's, um, it's not my, but usually these things aren't my decisions about who's, who, uh, who participates. Call, 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 call us, we'll, find, we'll find something for you to do. Call, call us and we'll find something for you to do. We have, we have our phone numbers here. Sir, 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 sir. Is it possible to have bronchitis without em emphysema? The answer is yes. Uh, usually there's a little bit of emphysema and, and a lot of bronchitis or uh, a, a lot of emphysema and a little bit of chronic bronchitis. 
there's different, as I say, the smoking causes both of them, but in different degrees in different people. So there are people who have almost fully chronic bronchitis, and some people have almost fully emphysema. Uh, another question about the medications. Uh, uh, antibiotic resistance with your z -Pak study. Yeah. And what about frequent z -Pak for potential flare-ups, using it prophylactically? Uh, Dan, Dan's asking a, a really excellent question about the idea of using chronic, you know, all the time daily antibiotic therapy. The people, who, the infectious disease doctors go crazy about this because they they know, and they're absolutely right, that the more we use antibiotics, the more we're going to get antibiotic resistance. And uh, in fact, in the study we did and published, there was signs of that happening. Um, and uh, the, the response to that is that we shouldn't use, do something like this in a lot of people, in everybody. This was, it would be a therapy that do doctors use, and they are using it in people who are having a tr tough time staying out of the hospital, and they need, they've, they've done everything else they can do. Can, will this, adding this on help? Yeah, it may well help, but it has that risk of causing uh, resistant organisms. Now, usually we have other antibiotics that we can throw into that, and it doesn't hurt the individual. But this is sort of a, a system-wide problem. When we get, we have antibiotics that are starting to be ineffective in everybody because we have bacteria that become resistant to them. It's a real problem. It's a, it's a, it's a risk-benefit sort of issue. But again, in that patient who is having trouble staying out of the hospital, this may be a reasonable therapy. Uh, was there a second part of the question? I'm sorry. Oh, about using z -Pak. Ah, uh, intermittently, intermittently uh, yeah. prophylactic. Well, that's what some doctors do. They tell you every, every three months they'll give you a Z-Pak and, uh, and take it. Uh, that study hasn't been done to show that particular strategy works. I wouldn't think it would be a terrible thing to do. Uh, and, and certainly the, uh, the answer is that if you're getting, feel like you're getting sick, sputum's changing character, changing color, to take antibiotics early rather than late is probably a good idea. And, you know, a good doctor will try to find a way of helping somebody do that. No, that's, that's good. Sir. One of your slides, yeah, you showed COPD is partially reversible. Is there anything coming down the pipe that would possibly reverse pulmonary psychosis? Uh, good, good question. COPD is partially reversible. I meant, uh, I guess I have to refine that a little bit. The the airflow obstruction that we see in COPD is partially reversible. We can make the airways relax a little bit when we give them bronchodilators. It used to be said that the airflow, nothing's going to change that. Now we know that good bronchodilators will make the airways relax. So in that sense, it's reversible. Not that the disease is reversible. It's that the spasm of the airways is reversible. Now, with pulmonary fibrosis, you know, we think that COPD is, is tough. Fibrosis is much tougher, and we, uh, until six months ago, we actually had no approved drugs for pulmonary fibrosis. <laughs> now we have two that are FDA approved and have shown effectiveness, and good papers showing that they're effective. Uh, they're not curative either, but they do have uh, benefits, and uh, doctors are sort of getting up on the learning curve understanding these two new drugs, and there's probably more to come. It's tougher. It's tougher than COPD, though. Well, my friends in a study. Friends in a study with a new one. Exactly. There's a lot of research going on. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hot area now that we find got something. But imagine a disease where they've got really nothing. You go in the doctor's office and they say, "Well, there's nothing for very much I can do for you." In COPD. We have things, but uh, pulmonary fibrosis is brand new. So, Jackie. You know what we're doing? Uh, back to oxygen therapy. We're starting to put a lot of our patients on the oxymizer appendix to extend the length of their tank. Yes, yes. Back to the future. And it works well. Uh, I, of course it does. Uh, the oxymizer was invented by our good friend Brian Type, um, and it's a very clever device. It's, it's a little thing you wear on your chest, and people say, oh, I don't want to have much. Well, what the, what the hell? Put it there. And it works very well, and it makes oxygen last longer so your tank doesn't get exhausted so fast. Some of these concentrators max out at three liters continuous, and then they go to pulp dose to like six. So if we can put them on a three liter continuous with the optimizer, it really adds a lot greater liter flow for those people with the pulmonary, with pulmonary fibrosis. Nice.
No, you're, you're, you're exactly right, Jack. That, that, that actually is a, the, the, those devices were, were devised in the late 1980s. Right. And they sort of went away when we had those little pulse dose devices. Yeah. But they, they really have some, uh, it's a, and Dr. Type is busy inventing new, 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 new devices, yeah. new devices. Yeah. Very clever. That's a that, that's that's very insightful. The um, the idea, the, the sort of the problem, the baseline problem is, it used to be much more prevalent that COPD patients would have uh, red blood cell levels that were too high. Their hematocrit was too high because the, the body's response to having low oxygen is to produce more red cells and try to carry whatever oxygen there is around there. So your oxygen, your, your hematocrit levels are high. I can remember when we used to have people in, in chest clinic where we would sit them down and take a pint of blood because their blood, their, their hematocrit was too high. Now that problem went away when we started giving oxygen therapy and people don't have that anymore. So now the problem is if, you're, if you have chronic illness, you're, you, don't, you produce too few red cells and more people today with COPD have low uh, hematocrit levels. And you're absolutely right that people do feel better when, they, when uh, their hematocrits are normal. And uh, there are other ways besides transfusions to help do that. Um, and I, I can understand that getting a transfusion, if it was low, it would make you feel a lot better. There, there's sort of an optimal level of, uh, of blood, of, of hematocrit, someplace in the mid-40s, 40%. Uh, that makes people feel that's a, a good, yeah, good balance. Your hemoglobin, hematocrit, same sort of thing. Exactly, it raises. So transfusions are good if you're you're low, but there are other ways of getting up. Iron pills and things like that. Please. I'm not. I'm not sure about the name, but it's basically non-invasive device that can remove the CO2 from the body. A non-invasive device can reduce to. And how, where, you're wearing your face, or? Uh, you know, I, uh, uh, the, uh, the, there's, a, there's a device that's sort of, it's like a, 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 a ventilator. Right. It's sort of, exactly, and it reduces CO2. It, it, it's a device, if you're not breathing enough at night, you'll, your breathing level sort of slows down, and the CO2 builds up because you're not exhaling it enough, and this device comes along and it sort of helps you breathe. And these, these are devices that actually do work. Uh, people with sleep problems use them sometimes. And uh, you know, if your doctor prescribes it, it's it's, it's probably a, a reasonable thing to use, and it does it does it really does help. It really does help. They're tough to use though, because they. Uh, so, Sir, do you have a question? First, this. Okay, so th there's a funny part of you know our. Our laws are sort of strange, and this is how I understand it. If you have a drug that's given by nebulization, where you, know, you get a little device and it sort of makes a, a mist and you inhale it, uh, that's reimbursed differently. Medicare treats that differently than it does the spritzers and the, the dry powder inhalers. So that some people can get those sort of drugs by nebulization for, for nothing or for, 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 for little money, whereas they're paying a lot of money for the... the uh, so, so that there's a, a market now for people, for companies to come out with nebulized drugs. And Performist and the, the, the inhaled steroid you spoke about are perfectly good drugs. And there are similar drugs that are present in the spritzers and the, the dry powders. But the one you're taking is a perfectly good combination, good for COPD. And if you, you're getting it without having to pay, pay much for it, that's more power to you. They're not better than the uh, other kinds of uh, other kinds of, of um, of drugs that are roughly equally effective, but if they're working for you fine and it doesn't cost you as much, that's great. But a little less convenient. Although the nebulizers now are not not like the ones in your. I remember from my grandfather's day where they sort of were on poles and they they hissed and popped and stuff like that. They're pretty convenient to use. You just sit there for five minutes and, and, and breathe on this thing, and you're done with it with the therapy. It's not, not nothing wrong with it at all. Well, once covered by Part B and the other. 
the other one's Part B. Correct. Part B versus Part D. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and I don't know anything about that. My, my wife knows about that stuff, not me. Is that enough? You guys have been great. I, I like... Oh, I'm sorry. What, 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 sure, sure. sure. Why is that? Why is that? Well, it says he wakes up at night and sort of jumps out of bed because he can't breathe and, and sort of sits to the side of the bed and leans forward and it makes it better. Uh, and how can that happen when he's receiving oxygen? Well, it turns out that shortness of breath isn't only a lack of oxygen. So oxygen doesn't fix all kinds of shortness of breath. It helps, but it doesn't fix it. And sort of the mechanics of breathing when you're lying down aren't quite the best. Your diaphragm is sort of pushed up, and you're not in the optimal position to breathe. And besides, you're asleep, and you're, then your brain is not making you breathe very much. So you just wake up, you're short of breath, and you sit up first, so you start breathing more. And then sitting, leaning forward is actually a very advantageous position to breathe. A lot of people lean forward and be against a chair, and it makes you feel better. When you're lying on your back, yep. are you putting pressure on your lungs where you're closing part of your lungs? Yeah, well, that, that's part of it. And it's also that your diaphragm has sort of, sort of moved up a little bit. And part of it, I don't, I'm not sure I, I understand exactly. But a lot of people find that they, sleeping sitting up is, uh, is a much easier way of doing it. I'm, I'm not suggesting that's a good, good way for you to do it. But um, the, the different positions are somehow easier and some positions are harder. Please. Thank you so much.